from what people tell me, it feels better than eating a great meal. It feels better than hanging out with your friends and it feels better than having great sex. It's an overwhelming amount of dopamine. Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 180th episode of this podcast dedicated to becoming your how-to manual on the care and feeding of your own brain. This particular episode is not so much going to be an optimization episode as a particular bear trap to avoid stepping into. Definitely something that you've heard of before is well reputed as being a bear trap, but on the other hand, that doesn't keep a lot of people from stepping into it. So we're going to be talking this week about opiates and the growing opiate addiction in America and worldwide, which as public health crises go is interesting in its origin, which comes as much as anything from the medical establishment and some unintended consequences of the way things have been done in the past couple of decades. We're going to be talking with a couple of doctors on the front lines of the opiate crisis, Ike Blome and Maria Steiner. That'll be in the main interview. If you wait around until the very end of the episode, keeping things somewhat ironic, I'm going to tell you some recent findings about people not wanting to know their own futures, but needless to say, that's as much as I can tell you now. Hang around for that in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. But right now, let's kick things off as usual with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So minding your business, keeping your head in the game, eyes on the prize, focused on your task, all these things, these ideas of cognitive control generally are pretty well regarded or one of the things thought to separate adults from children and emblematic of not being a total space cadet. But all of us allow our minds to wander at some time, daydreaming, drifting off into sleep, zoning out, not paying attention in class. It happens to the best of us. And scientists at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences and the University of York were curious why some people seem to benefit from letting their thoughts run free while others do not? What are people doing differently and do the styles of mind wandering have physical consequences in the brain? Since people's control of real world physical events starts worsening as soon as people start turning internally with their thoughts, mind wandering has often been thought of as a failure of cognitive control, but it turns out to be a more complex picture. Participants in this study were given psychological questionnaires and asked to respond to statements like, I allow my thoughts to wander on purpose, or I find my thoughts wandering spontaneously. So they get a psychological picture of the person and then putting said person in the MRI scanner to see how their brain actually appears. The different styles of mind wandering that were described were then related to differences in brain organisms said Johannes Galschert, the first author of the study. We found that in people who often purposely allow their minds to go off on a tangent, the cortex is thicker in some prefrontal regions. Furthermore, in people who intentionally mind wander, two main brain networks broadly overlap each other. The default mode network, which is active when focusing on information from memory, and the frontoparietal network, which stabilizes our focus and inhibits irrelevant stimuli as part of our cognitive control system. All of which seems to imply that mind wandering is somewhat of a practicable skill, says Goldshirt. Our brain barely distinguishes between focusing outwards on our environment or inwards on our thoughts. And in both situations, the control network is involved. In contrast, people that reported higher levels of spontaneous mind wandering often had cortical thinning in the parietal and posterior temporal regions in the left hemisphere. The default mode network is the one that you'll often hear referenced when people are talking about meditation. One of the goals of many types of meditation is to quiet the default mode network, which is really involved in the thinking about the self, the awareness of self. But one overall finding here is that the level of intentionality in one's mind wandering correlates with differences between the integration of the control network and the default mode network. Network. The more deliberate you are with guiding your thoughts, the greater the integration between those two systems. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title twice. So last week was the last week in which we had that giveaway contest for people that left reviews on iTunes. We got a slew of reviews out of that. Here are a couple from that grab bag. Breeze Blocks from the USA says, the content of your podcast has changed my life and I'm hoping it'll change my partner's life as well. I've been on a rabbit trail of information in helping my girlfriend with a cluster of chronic illnesses. What started as an interest in personal brain optimization has resulted in a hunt to save my girlfriend's quality of life. And Axial Clown from Australia said, Some days I can't be an adult, some days I'd rather stay in bed and study, and those days I turn to Smart Drug Smarts, my cognitive caffeine. Well, a big thanks to both of you. Thanks to everyone who has left reviews recently. Thanks to those of you who might be leaving reviews in the future. It is a super great way to appease the algorithm gods at iTunes. Make sure that they recognize that Smart Drug Smarts has listeners who like what we're doing here and introduce us to new people. Of course, you could always introduce us to new people the old-fashioned way by sticking your earbuds in a stranger's ear and saying, Hey, listen to this. 
We're actually doing a website redesign over at smartdrugsmarts.com. Got that going on behind the scenes now. We've not yet unveiled the new site in probably a couple of weeks till we do. But one of the things that I'd like to do there is to catalog some of the existing episodes that we have a little bit better. And every now and then somebody will say, oh, I am binge listening to all of your episodes. And so the reason I mention this is if you happen to be in the middle of a current Smart Drug Smarts binge and are going through the episodes at some rampant clip and you wouldn't mind taking a couple of notes for us as you do so, that could be a huge help. So if that sounds like you, just just reach out to me, jesse at smartdrugsmarts.com. Let me know. There could probably be a couple of bottles of Nexus or Mitogen in it for you. Nexus and Mitogen, by the way, are our supplement stacks that we have over at axonlabs.io. Nexus being a cognitive stack built around aniracetam and CDP choline, and Mitogen, a mitochondrial support stack that anecdotally has been helpful for everything from hangovers to digestion. Put a giant grain of salt on both those. Those are not scientifically verified. Just a couple of emails I've gotten from people saying, hey, you'll never believe this, but Mitogen does X for me. It is true that mitochondria are in absolutely every cell in your body, though, and every cell in pretty much anything's body. I think if you are a eukaryotic organism, then you cannot help but have mitochondria. So Mitogen is there to assist the production and recycling of your body's energy at an intracellular level, and both of those can be found over at axonlabs.io. Smart Drug Smarts has a newsletter. You can sign up for that at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. We typically keep that pretty neuroscience focused, but can stray off into everything from Disney cartoon characters to why you really don't want to catch cholera. But that is all for now. We got a longer interview coming up here, actually a double interview as it turns out. So let's scoot ahead to that. Smart Drug Smarts. So if you remember back 15 episodes ago, in episode number 165, we talked about a substance called kratom, which is a Southeast Asian plant which has both opiate and stimulant qualities, depending on the dosage you take it at. An interesting episode in its own right, and in that episode we spoke with Dr. Alicia Lidecker, and afterwards she recommended that I get in touch with one of her colleagues, Dr. Ike Blom, who is going to be the primary interviewee in this episode, who is a medical doctor who works on the front lines of the opiate crisis going on in America now, literally dealing with people who are experiencing experiencing overdoses, stuff like that. So not so much a research guy as a getting his hands dirty guy is really there in the trenches, but going to be talking about both the social aspects, what's going on neurologically that makes opiate addiction such a absolutely difficult thing to shake once it gets a neurological foothold, some of the countermeasures and harm reducing strategies that are being tried now with various degrees of success, how big a problem this currently is and how much bigger it could conceivably get. Dr. Blom is based in Massachusetts, works with various hospitals in the area, particularly the UMass Memorial Medical Center. Also with us today is Maria Steiner, who is a third-year medical student at UMass, going into emergency medicine and currently doing her rotations. One terminological reminder before we get going, we use the term overdose quite a bit in this conversation, but it's worth noting that overdose does not always mean deadly overdose. I kind of feel like that's my default thing that I think about when I hear, oh, somebody's overdosed. An overdose could mean a lethal or just a toxic amount of something. So you could legitimately say, I overdosed on chicken nuggets if you eat so many chicken nuggets that it made you throw up afterwards. There's some pretty shocking statistics coming up about the likelihood of overdosing in a given year for an opiate user, but bear in mind that they're not talking about strictly lethal overdoses when that comes up. So here we go with a conversation that will include everything from kratom to naloxone to opium, heroin, and loperamide. Buckle up and here we go with Dr. Ike Blom and Maria Steiner. Right now, we have a huge opioid crisis in the entire United States, and that is the amount of opioid use, both therapeutic and abusive, has gone up dramatically. Since 1999, our use of, say, just oxycodone alone has risen by 500%. Wow. And if you take a look at the opioids that are consumed worldwide, the United States are far ahead of any other country. And of course, you could make the argument that if you live in sub-Saharan Africa, maybe you simply don't have access to opioids, and that's why they don't consume opioids. But multiple other civilized countries, including Japan, France, Germany, that have access to these drugs don't consume nearly as much as the people in the United States. And now the question is, why does this happen? Do we experience more painful events over here? Do we have more accidents? Do we have higher rates of cancer that require all those drug usages? And really, the answer to that is no. You're more likely to get shot in the United States, but pretty much everything else is the same. Something that should be realized is there's lots of people who are actually taking opiates for medical reasons, for chronic pain management. And when your body is regulated to do so, you can actually function very well in the world. It's not illegal to drive a car if you're taking opiates, if you are doing so in a prescribed safe manner. So you actually may be interacting with people on opiate pain medicine often and have no idea that's the case. And one reason why you know I got a chance to work with Ike is, and that he was so passionate about this topic is how often you see it in the emergency room. If you're trained up as a highly specialized 
specialized physician in a different field, again, you just never see it. So you're not aware of the size of the problem. And once I began working with him and also did some work with the Worcester Public Health Council, combined with the budget cuts that have hit the state with the epidemic, it's an unbelievable problem that needs to be solved and people need to address it. Something happened in the United States a couple of years ago where the pharmaceutical industry had these products that they wanted to sell and they needed to convince physicians that this is actually a safe drug. A lot of physicians were reluctant to prescribe opioids even to people that had significant pain from cancer, for example, just because these drugs were known to be so addictive. So along came something called OxyContin. And OxyContin is the same as oxycodone. It's just in a pill that's designed to dissolve very slowly. So the idea was if it's a slow release, it won't get you high and it won't get you addicted. Turns out that's not true at all. And the pharmaceutical industry actually had to settle because of false advertisement to the contrary. But this set into motion a new approach to pain, pain perceived by patients. The first step was that pain was introduced as what they called the fifth vital sign. Now, when you come to the emergency room or to your doctor, you will always be asked to rate your pain on a scale from one through 10, one being almost no pain, 10 being the worst pain you could possibly imagine. And that has become the standard now. The fact that it's considered a vital sign is somewhat of a misnomer because medically speaking, a sign is something that the clinician observes. A symptom is something that the patient experiences. So by default, it can't be a vital sign because I don't appreciate it from the outside. You appreciate it as the patient. Right. So that was the first step. Then the next step was that patient satisfaction was tied to physician compensation. So this is done through surveys. One of the most well-known surveys is Prescani. And Prescani is sent only to patients that see an emergency medicine doctor and get discharged, which means if you come in and you're gravely injured or really, really sick, and I really save your life and you end up in the intensive care unit, you will not get a survey. If, however, you had an ankle sprain and I sent you home from the emergency department, you might get a survey. And on that survey, it will say, this is paraphrasing from the actual survey, but did the clinical team do everything in their power to control your pain? And I can do a lot to control your pain. I can make you stop breathing. So people that were hoping to get pain medication or people that simply can't handle pain very well are more likely to say, yes, they tried to control my pain if you give them opioids. Rather than seeing that pain is, while uncomfortable, also necessary because, well, you sprained your ankle and your ankle hurting tells you to not put weight on it and allowing it to heal. But this set up a culture where now physicians were very prone to prescribe opioids because it was directly tied to patient satisfaction and the patient satisfaction was directly tied to their bonuses at the end of the year. So you now incentivize an entire generation of physicians to prescribe opioids. Was this a change in the laws that and this is like an unforeseen consequence or what actually transpired to make this change happen again? Well, it's not a change in the laws. Congress didn't get together and said, this is how it has to be done now. This was a change in medical culture that was influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. And so now you have a patient that has chronic back pain, for example, and we know very well that treatment with opioids alleviates pain temporarily, but over the long term will make the patient's pain worse. And this is something called opioid-induced hyper And we know this from animal studies as well as from human studies and observational studies. Yet in order for me to create patient satisfaction, I can only do this by giving you a prescription for oxycodone. And in addition to that, think of the time restraints that I have as an emergency medicine physician. I have several unseen patients. Some of them might be dying. I don't know because I haven't been able to see them yet. And I have the choice of either writing a prescription for oxycodone and not have a discussion with the patient or sitting down and explaining the patient why I'm not comfortable prescribing them oxycodone because maybe they're already on different opioids or maybe they have a significant alcoholism and alcohol with opioids does not mix very well. It's actually a lethal combination. And then these patients get upset and that ties up more of my time. And if they complain, then I need to go to my boss's office and I need to explain myself. They may even complain to the board of medicine. So this can escalate and soak up so much of my time. So now the question is, do I want to do the right thing or do I want to do the fast and easy thing? And there's a lot of physicians that will go for the fast and easy thing. Listening to you talk, I was reminded of the AIDS crisis in the late 1980s. They kind of started talking to the public about AIDS education in a way that would have been probably unthinkable before because they were sending kids home with little pamphlets for their parents to read that talked about drug use and anal sex and stuff like that that would have just been unthinkable a decade before to like even have a public discourse around this. But they figured it was a problem that was growing so fast that they needed to pull out all the stops. 
Do you feel like the current opiate crisis is near a watershed moment like that, where people say, hey, we've got to educate the public in a more proactive, aggressive way? Yes, I do think it does. And I think you're picking up on something pretty nuanced there, because I've noticed in my medical education that the way we address sex and safe sex practices is incredibly different than the way physicians were trained prior to the epidemic. And that was, a, I think, a pivotal point in the way that medical professionals interact with the public and realizing that the dynamic between between a physician and patient sort of needs to change, become vastly more comfortable. And I think you're correct because opioid epidemic is now killing more people each year than the AIDS epidemic was at its height. And you were talking about that opioids seem to affect different parts of the population more than other parts, but that is less so than it was for the AIDS epidemic. I mean, I'll tell you, every single patient I talk to in Worcester, regardless of how they appear or whatever, I make certain to ask about illicit substances because it is far more common than you think. And I'm not certain that older physicians do that. So now there is a movement afoot to really reverse that course. In Massachusetts, for example, I am now required to look up a patient in something called the prescription monitoring program, which records all Schedule two medications, medications are potentially abusable, that patients fill at pharmacies in Massachusetts and surrounding states. So I am by law required to look that up, no matter who the patient is. And you'd be surprised what this does to physicians. A, this is a lot of work. You have to type in this name, you have to type in the date of birth, you have to make sure you got the correct patient, you have to look through the history. So being a little bit work avoidant, you may rethink, does this patient really need oxycodone for their ankle sprain or maybe Motrin and Tylenol will cut it. And I found myself to prescribe a lot less simply because under time constraints, I didn't want to look it up. That sounds horrible, but that's how it is. And interestingly, nobody came back and said, you know what, I need a stronger pain medication because the Motrin and Tylenol just didn't cut it. So I was probably unconsciously over prescribing to begin with. Wow. And in addition to that, once in a while, you find find out that the sweet little 80-year-old lady has been to five different EDs in the last week in different states and has collected opioid prescriptions in all of them in patients that you would not suspect would be doctor shopping or drug seeking. All of a sudden you discover that pattern, then you have to have a very candid conversation with that patient. So it sounds like the current opioid crisis really started based on legitimate medicine. This wasn't like a heroin dealers getting together and saying, hey, let's make street heroin cheaper for everybody. But it's more the people who are at least getting their initial exposure to these opioids in a fully above the board context and then things devolving from there. Yeah, I mean, we really dropped the ball on this as physicians. Nobody wakes up one morning and says, you know what, I want to try heroin today because heroin is a big and scary thing. But to get started on a pill that my doctor prescribed me and then just never stop that's a different issue. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means your brain is wired in a way that the reward you get from taking this medication creates really neurological pathways that make it difficult to stop. Something I remember a mentor once told me was that nobody wakes up and says, I want to be an addict. Mm -hmm. The problem is they have a disease that's affected their brain anatomy, brain chemistry, and they can't help it. And so when you talk to these patients or when you see them in the office, you're given an opportunity to help them. And I think physicians and the public still thinks that addiction is a choice. And I have heard of numerous patient-physician interactions and witnessed it myself where a physician squanders that opportunity to have a real effect. We actually get a lot of training now in medical school on how to counsel patients and assess their level of readiness for change and what sort of therapy or intervention is appropriate at that time. It's important if a patient is in your office or you're having some chance to interact with them, you really have to treat it like an opportunity. And you may not get everything done that you want to get done. A patient may say, you know, screw you, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do and walk out the door. But it behooves the physician to do the best they can. And I think that the mindset that you're talking about, the switch, that occurred is helping us do that better. So now the question is, what do we do with all these people who are on opioids? And one of the things is, well, we need to reduce the prescriptions and we need to provide a way out for people who are addicted to opioids. The problem is that mental health is horribly underfunded in this country. So I have people that come to the emergency room and they say, I'm here because I want to quit. And all I can say is, well, good luck. Here's a list of phone numbers. Maybe somebody will have a bed for you in a week. Whereas the right thing to do by the patient would be, I'm so glad you want to quit, let me mobilize all those resources that I have available to help you do so. But we simply don't have the resources because it's not funded well. 
you know, if somebody wants to write their congressman and say, support X, what should they be supporting at this point? I think that they should be supporting programs that provide naloxone or that provide addiction services. Communities now have frameworks for these programs. The reality is funding, as I'm sure you realize, is always an issue. And so encouraging local governments to divert funds to those programs or making grassroots efforts yourself can make a huge difference. The most successful programs come out of small communities. So that's what I would say to somebody who wants to get involved. You have to think that an economist somewhere has already run these numbers. For every dollar spent on a treatment program that can get somebody back to being a functional member of society who can be taxed and things like that, it's got to pay for itself a hundred times over, right? Yeah. So there's many politicians who have attempted to run on this uh, policy that why are we throwing money at addicts if they want to overdose and kill themselves, let them do so. So economists addressed that and looked at it. And I can send you the citation. There's multiple studies that have shown it makes financial sense in a community to reverse overdoses. And it, it makes sense on multiple levels. The first is that you're stopping people from needing to be admitted to the hospital. So naloxone programs actually reduce immediate health care costs. So if you are an opiate addict, the chance that you will have at least one overdose in your length of addiction is very high, especially once you move to heroin. It's not as controlled a habit. So the chance you will overdose is very high. So if you stop those overdoses from leading to mortality, a certain percentage of those people are going to become clean. And as you said, become functional members of society again. There's an economic benefit there. So there are multiple analyses I've shown it makes sense in a community to have these types of programs in place financially and socially. Probably most of us have seen a movie like Train Spotting that shows somebody trying to get off of heroin and locking oneself in a room and crapping your pants and basically feeling like you're going to die for several days. Is there any real difference between breaking an addiction to something like heroin and breaking an addiction to something like oxycodone? Well, they're both medications in the same class. So the withdrawal is essentially the same. The good thing about it is that opioid withdrawal doesn't kill you. Alcohol withdrawal can. Opioid withdrawal does not. It makes you wish you were dead because you have horrible diarrhea and horrible vomiting and sweatiness. But unless you get injured from the dehydration that comes with the diarrhea, it's not lethal. So some people quit using opioids by themselves at home and they do so successfully. Other people do much better when they are on a replacement therapy such as methadone and suboxone. So both these medications go to the same receptors as heroin does, for example, but they are something called partial agonist, meaning they bind to it, they activate that receptor a little bit, but not to the same degree as heroin. So it's enough to take away the craving, but not enough to get you high. And that allows these people to be functional and go to work and find a job and become functional members of society again. Sometimes they're able to be titrated off these replacement therapies. Sometimes they stay on for the rest of their life. Then there is a group that wants to self-treat and self-treatment can occur with things like Kratom, for example, which is a tree that grows in Southeast Asia that contains mitogynine, which is a chemical that also binds to the opioid receptors in the body. And you can just buy this over the counter. It's legal. And so people try to treat themselves that way. Other people use loperamide which is a medication that is used against diarrhea. And loperamide is also an opioid that you can buy over the counter. But the big difference between loperamide and oxycodone is that loperamide has a lot of difficulty entering the body. It stays mostly in the bowels where it's supposed to work as an anti-diarrhea agent. But if you take enough of it, you overcome the inability to cross into the bloodstream just by sheer force because you're taking so much that it actually starts to work against withdrawal. And then last but not least, there are people who abuse loperamide in order to get high. So these people, of course, expose themselves to all the risks of opioids, but also other associated risks that come with the toxicity of loperamide in these high doses. Even horrible things tend to find an equilibrium point somewhere. I'm wondering if you, know, you look at the sigmoidal curve of new cases of people becoming opiate addicts, have we reached a plateau stage or is this still continuing to grow? It's not plateaued yet. The rate is still increasing, but it is not as increasing at the same rate that it was, say, five years ago. And when you look at how people get addicted to opioids, initially it was largely due to prescriptions. And now it's so easy to gain access to heroin on the streets that people can get addicted through those methods. So we don't have as much data or knowledge about how people are getting addicted now, but the problem is growing. 
what are the estimates in a country of 300 million people? How many of them are currently struggling with some level of opiate addiction? Well, we know that deaths from overdoses have now exceeded the deaths from motor vehicles. We have crossed that line a couple of years ago where more people die of overdoses than car accidents. Wow, that's unbelievable. If you get tangled up in opiates, what's your chance of actually dying of an overdose? It's really hard to estimate those things. Because of the social stigma that comes with drug use, people are not well supervised in medical care, which means the only people that I encounter are the people that did overdose. So I see a biased subsection of the population. I have no idea how many people are out there that are, and I use quotation marks in this, are using heroin responsibly, big quotation marks. But the ones that never overdose, I will never see. So we simply don't know how many people are out there. But the estimate is that everybody who uses heroin will overdose anywhere between one and 10 times per year. Wow. There are people in my emergency department that I know by first name because I see them all the time. In that case, what defines an overdose? Like, are there non-life-threatening overdoses? What sort of is the tripwire for that term? So all opioids, whether it be oxycodone or heroin, they bind to something called the mu receptor. They bind to other receptors as well, but the mu receptor is the one that gives you the high. That's the one that makes you euphoric and feel good. However, the mu receptor also sits in a part of your brain called the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata is your breathing center. What the medulla does is it maintains the automaticity of breathing. Right now, as you and I are talking, you're not thinking, take a breath. It just happens. When you sleep, for example, it just happens automatically. The problem is that a drug binding the mu receptor will deactivate that automaticity. So now you get high on, say, Vicodin, and you fall asleep because, well, that's what opioids do to you. They make you sleepy. And once you fall asleep, now your breathing automaticity is disabled, and you're going to slow down your breathing, and eventually you're going to stop. And that's what kills you. You simply stop breathing. And no matter how much CO2 builds up in your bloodstream and how low your oxygen saturation drops, it cannot kick back in unless you get the antidote or unless somebody's breathing for you. So that's why we have now started to distribute the antidote to all opioids widely in the communities, a medication called naloxone, also known as Narcan. And there's a big movement right now to get this in the hands of people that are most likely to need it. So first, we only had it in hospital. So you were brought in by the ambulance, we gave you the antidote, and hopefully it wasn't too late. But think about how long it takes for an ambulance to come to your house. And then they load you up and then they bring you to the hospital. That's a long time to hold your breath. Sure, the medics can bag you a little bit and kind of breathe for you. But even if you just need to wait 10 minutes for an ambulance, that's a long time to wait if you're not breathing. Sure. So we started to distribute the antidote to police officers who typically respond much earlier than an ambulance just because they're more mobile. They drive a small car, not a big truck. And that worked pretty well. And then the next step was, well, if we have people People who are known to use drugs, they are around other people who also use drugs. Why don't we give the antidote to people who use drugs? And we are trying to bring it out into the community. And so far, that actually had pretty decent results. There was, of course, some concern, especially from the more conservative elements of society, that if we give drug users the antidote, won't that just escalate their drug use? Which was the same argument as, well, if we put seatbelts in car, won't people drive more riskily, which didn't pan out. It also didn't pan out that people that got the HPV vaccine all of a sudden sleep with everybody. Just because I own a bicycle helmet doesn't mean I like hitting myself in the head. Yeah. So the distribution of naloxone to drug users has not resulted in increased drug use. And there are multiple studies that document this. It doesn't increase the frequency or the amount used. So that was pretty successful. The problem is, by definition, you are unable to administer the medication to yourself. You need to have a second person there. And what is the route of administration? Is this a shot? Is it a pill? Is it a, what is it? Oh, that's an excellent question. So you can give it in various ways. The original version that it was an intravenous injection, which of course a lay person can't do. And however, put a needle directly into the thigh, something called an intramuscular injection. But the problem with that is you are administering a needle to a person who is at increased risk of having hepatitis C or HIV. And now you, as the bystander, are holding a sharp that was just in that patient. So that wasn't a great way of delivering the antidote to the lay public. So along came the nasal atomizer, which you can think of a filter that when you push fluid through, it forms tiny, tiny droplets and you stick that in the nose and you just push the antidote through that atomizer and the tiny droplets get absorbed by the mucosa in the nose. And from there, it goes directly into your brain and into the rest of your body. 
The advantage of it is it's needle free. The disadvantage of it is it takes a little longer. It takes maybe a minute to work rather than 30 seconds when I give it to you IV. So because we live in a society where pharmaceutical companies want to make a lot of money, there was a pharmaceutical company called Kaleo that developed something called the Evzio. The Evzio you can think of as an EpiPen for naloxone. It is an auto injector and it is a device that will talk to you. So you activate it and it will tell you where to place it. And it is a needle injection, but it's designed in a way that the needle will retract back into the apparatus so you can't stick yourself after. It needs to go on the outside of your thigh and you push it and it clicks and the needle goes in. It does a countdown timer of five seconds and then you remove it and the needle has already retracted. So you can imagine that this is foolproof and very easy to use. And if you compare this to using an atomizer, which you need to assemble, you need to put the atomizer on top of a syringe and then put it in the nostril and then push half in one and half in the other nostril. That's more complicated. And if you're a parent of a drug-using child and you have this antidote at home and you find your kid not breathing, assembling something like this is actually a very difficult task because you are scared shitless. So that's what the FZO essentially, I don't want to say exploited, but that's what they tried to address. Sure. There's a single study that looked at the efficacy of the atomizer versus the FZO. That study's industry-sponsored and three out of the five authors on that study work for Calio, the company that makes the device. So take everything with a grain of salt here, but it's been shown that even without training, 80% of people use the FZO correctly and with training, 100% use it correctly. So that sounds promising, right? Here's the problem. Remember how we talked about very poor funding for all things drug and rehab related? Yeah. If you want to bring this out into the community, you need to flood the community with these devices. Naloxone with an atomizer costs you about $20. The FZO started around $350 and is now several thousand dollars. Wow. Just like the EpiPen, they have hiked up the price as much as they could because it's still on a patent. And with enough lobbying power, you can require, for example, schools to have the FZO rather than an atomizer. That's the same that was done with the EpiPen where schools in the United States are not allowed to stock a generic EpiPen. They need the brand name EpiPen, which has become very expensive lately. That is really unfortunate when big industry and public health do not have their incentives aligned at all. Well, I mean, they're in the business of making money and they're very good at it, but I am in the business of helping people and saving lives. And sometimes I need to make a utilitarian decision of how I do the most good for the most amount of people. And if I have the choice of bringing, say, 100 units of naloxone into a community for $20 each or five FZOs, the chance of an FZO being around when you need it, even though 100% of people can administer it, is going to be hard. Versus if only half of the people can administer an atomizer correctly, but one is available, at least I got a 50% shot. Is there somewhere within the population of people that are using opiates, sort of a, you know, a hidden cache of responsible users in there who are not increasing their use, maybe not actually weaning themselves off, but also not getting sucked into a downward spiral with it? Well, the answer to that is most likely not. And the reason for that being is that the reason people use drugs is to feel good. And the way drugs make you feel good is they increase the secretion of dopamine, among other things, also serotonin, but mostly dopamine. Once you have this artificial release of dopamine, at these high degrees, the pleasurable effect that heroin must give you must be so intense. I don't know. I've never tried, so I can't compare. But from what people tell me, it feels better than eating a great meal. It feels better than hanging out with your friends. And it feels better than having great sex. It's an overwhelming amount of dopamine. So now everything else in life that secretes dopamine in your head will be not as rewarding. And after a while, even the response to the same amount of drug will diminish. And now in order to feel high again, in order to feel good again, you need to use more drug. So to reach that same level, that's a concept called tolerance, you need to use more and more. That is why most people will spiral down once they initiate drug use like that. Do you see any perfectly well-adjusted, happy people that also just happen to be opiate addicts? All the time. I think one of the saddest stories for me was a man who, a hardworking man, built his own business, suffered a back injury and was prescribed pain medication, went through multiple different types of therapies, physical therapy, other such, to try to resolve this issue. And the only thing that could relieve his pain was opiate pain medication. And he did successfully so for a long period of time. And then exactly what you're talking about happened, an acute 
acute stressor occurred. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think his business had a a rough quarter or something. And next thing you know, he developed a full-blown addiction and crisis. And I think the tragedy of this is that prior to this, he'd had a happy marriage, three kids, his own business. And over the subsequent 10 years, he lost all of that and had to go through rehab multiple times. And when I met him, he was clean, but he related a story to me where he'd been at the breakfast with his teenage son that morning and had found out that his son had used Percocets at a party and treated it very casually. For this man, that was just sort of the most tragic thing because he had seen his whole life fall apart due to this substance. And here is his son, who is a teenager and quite ignorant and quite naive, was really expressing a common thought amongst youth that these things are not very dangerous or they're not going to have long-term consequences. I'm sure you've seen in the media, everyone always loves to write about it affects every layer of society. And that's because injuries and pain affect everyone. Yeah, arthritis and car accidents are no respecters of social class. I think the statistic that recently came out was that 20% of Americans are going to see their benefits changed if the new Republican plan gets passed through. And 2 million of those 20 million are substance abusers who will be affected by that. But it really is a problem that affects all layers of society. So it used to be true that you could use really non-validated clinical indicators that doctors use colloquially, like something we call the tooth to tattoo ratio. If you have more tattoos than you have teeth. (laughs) And, you know, this used to be the person we would easily identify as an addict. That's no longer the case, especially with opioids in pill form. The disease of addiction has really moved into suburbia, into middle class and upper class families. And this is no longer the homeless guy. It's no longer the junkie that you imagine. It is the housewife. It's the 15 year old kid in school that got hooked. Those are people we see now. There's still a lot of social stigma, I think, around any sort of addiction, but it's interesting that some addictions are more stigmatized than others. So I think you're right. And I think what you're speaking to is sort of a growing trend in public policy and in the public viewpoint that addiction can't really be viewed as that. It needs to be viewed as a disease. And you're entirely right in that a prescription painkiller addiction versus a intravenous drug addiction to heroin may be viewed differently in society. Medically, it's a different method and there's different health risks associated with using intravenous drugs. But the opioid addiction is identical. It's you're addicted to opioids. And there are very few addicts who stay with just the prescription pills. I think as the medical side becomes more aware of the problem and changes their practices, people are moving towards heroin use and changing that dynamic. After a while, you run out of money and heroin is much cheaper than prescription pills. How much does it cost to be a heroin addict these days? 20 to to $100 a day is a typical heroin habit. Yeah, so that, that's not nothing. I mean, that's a car payment or it could be an apartment. And you're not able to work or contribute and maintain a job while doing that. The stigma is still there because you associate drug use as a moral failing. And that's really not the case. We have really good evidence and we have functional MRIs to back this up that shows that people that start using a substance have a change in brain anatomy that sets up this reward circuit that it's hard to come out of. So when you do an activity that feels really good, the biochemistry in your brain stabilizes those neuronal connections. And you're more likely to engage in that same behavior again. Whereas if something feels bad, the opposite happens. So now you hijack this pathway. And that's what all drugs of abuse have in common. They hijack the reward pathway. And by so doing, they will stabilize the neuronal circuitry that caused the behavior to begin with. And so once that has taken place, it is now an anatomical problem. They have a change in their brain anatomy that results in their behavior. Just like you can't yell at a diabetic to make more insulin in their pancreas, you can't yell at a drug addict to just stop. There's more to it. There's a behavioral component to it, of course, but there's also a medical component to it. There's a definite anatomical change in the brain that occurs. One of the things that I'm wondering about is the distinction, to, I mean, to the extent that there is one between an opiate that would come through medical channels versus a street drug like heroin. Biochemically, how close are we talking? It's extremely easy to get and they carry different names. So you're talking about oxycodone versus heroin versus morphine, but the same sort of active metabolite in your body. So the difference is the formulations and how quickly they affect you, how long they affect you. But actually, if you wanted to get heroin, I guarantee you could get it far more easily than you think. I think a few questions here or there, it's everywhere. And it's one of those things that until you know what to look for, you don't see it. But once you know what you're looking for, you'll realize just how common it is. 
let's say that I break my leg, I go into the hospital, I need a pain reliever, and I'm given an opiate by prescription by my doctor. Is there the mythical, you take something once or twice and you get hooked despite your best interest, or does that never happen? Is somebody always like going a little beyond what their prescription requires? And at some point, is it a conscious choice or do people get addicted by accident? So probably a little bit of both. I don't think that people get addicted from taking a single pill of pain reliever if they have a legitimate injury. And, you know, if you come in with a broken leg, those things hurt and you deserve pain control. We're not out as physicians to leave you suffering and pain out of fear that you may become an opioid addict. We need to treat you appropriately. But pain is also an okay response to have. So the goal should be to get your pain to a level where it's tolerable, but not to get you pain free. Because by the time I get you pain free, I have overshot. I've given you way too much pain medication. If you cannot feel your broken leg, you have way too much morphine on board. One to three percent of patients prescribed pain medication do not stop taking it. So when it becomes an addiction is when they stop using it for a therapeutic purpose, meaning that they no longer have pain. And once you're using an opioid without the pain, your chance of addiction is vastly increased. However, you can also still be addicted while you have pain. Another thing that's happening in the drug world right now is that we see less and less heroin and more and more fentanyl. Fentanyl is in the same class as heroin. It is an opioid. It goes to the same receptors, but it's a lot more powerful and it is completely synthetic. In order to produce heroin, you at one point in time need to import poppies or you need to import the paste or the opium from usually the Middle East, Afghanistan, for example, which means you have to cross several borders. And smuggling drugs is a dangerous business and it's much cheaper if you can produce a local. And because fentanyl is completely synthetic, it can be produced right here in the United States. You don't need to cross borders. And because the chemical structure looks completely different from, say, heroin or morphine or hydromorphone, a lot of drug dogs simply aren't trained to sniff it. Fentanyl will also not trigger the standard urine dipstick opioid test because it looks nothing like morphine. So because of that, the market really has changed and more and more people actually receive fentanyl when they buy heroin. The problem is that if you have have a drug that is a thousand times more potent, measuring out the right amount to take without dying becomes more difficult because now if you make a 1% error, that's a problem. That may be why we see more and more overdoses now because people don't know that they're getting fentanyl. In addition to that, fentanyl binds to the receptor so tightly that it's hard for the antidote to bump it off. So even if we give naloxone or Narcan, and typically we give 0.4 milligrams or 2 milligrams, sometimes it doesn't cut it. I've had people where I needed to give between 10 and 20 milligrams, so 10 times the dose that I normally give to get them breathing again which then makes distribution of naloxone to the lay public a problem because if I give you two milligram dose to have at home to treat a heroin overdose and your kid overdoses on fentanyl, you can give it. It's not going to do anything. It's not powerful enough to reverse it. Is fentanyl a purely illicit substance or is there any medical use for that? No, actually, it is one of the main medical pain control agents that we use, especially in anesthesia. Unlike morphine and hydromorphone and all those other IV opioid pain control medications that we have, fentanyl doesn't affect your blood pressure very much. So in a trauma patient who is bleeding to death, you don't want to give a medication that lowers the patient's blood pressure further. So we use a lot of fentanyl actually in the medical world. But fentanyl does not come as a pill. It is a medication for in-hospital use only. It's nothing that gets prescribed. People that are having problems with opiate addiction, I'm wondering about sort of the demographics age-wise. Does it bias towards a certain age group? Does it bias towards men versus women? I think it is definitely biased men towards women. Per usual, women are making smarter choices. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not touching that. I have so many statistics for that one. But in terms of age-wise, I think it's not as biased as you'd think. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it really does affect many different age groups. Are there any popular misconceptions about opiate use that you think your average man on the street would be just shocked to hear? Yeah, a couple. So there's a reluctance to inject a drug because you need to get a needle. It has a higher stigma. You start getting track marks and people around you can actually see that you're doing this. So people try to not inject drugs. There is a technique with heroin called chasing the dragon. In brief, what you do is you take a piece of aluminum foil and you put a little bit of heroin on it. You hold a lighter underneath and that causes paralysis of the heroin and you then take a straw and the term chasing the dragon comes from you chasing the smoke with a straw you inhale the smoke you inhale the pyrolysate of heroin 
And this is perceived to be a safer way of administration because you don't stick yourself with a needle. The problem with this technique is it is associated with something we call heroin-associated spongiform leukoencephalopathy, or HASL for short, H-A-S-L, which is essentially the same as mad cow disease. It's a different mechanism, but it is also a spongiform leukoencephalopathy. We don't know why it happens this way. We don't know if it's a problem with the aluminum foil or if there's a combustion product of the heroin that's doing this. We simply don't know at this time. There have been a lot of cases reported in the Netherlands where chasing the dragon is one of the most common routes of administration of heroin. Just a couple of weeks ago, I saw somebody in the emergency department myself that had that. So this is something that's perceived as safe, but truly isn't. The other thing that is common now, especially among teenagers that try to get high, is the use of loperamide, which we talked about earlier. That's maybe something we should address here because loperamide is available over the counter. So you can just go to your your local grocery store and just buy that stuff. And it is an opioid. Now you have in your intestine and in your brain something called a P-glycoprotein pump. And think of the P-glycoprotein pump as a bouncer. If it identifies a substance that shouldn't enter, it will pump it back out. So the reason why Imodium or Loperamide is over the counter, even though it's an opioid, is because it is very well recognized by the P-glycoprotein pump. So it can't even cross the intestinal wall. It doesn't even get absorbed. But you know, a bouncer can only keep out so many people from a club. So if you take enough of it, you will overcome the ability of P-glycoprotein to pump loperamide back out into the intestinal lumen and you start absorbing it. But then you still need to cross into the brain. So you need to take a whole lot to also overcome the P-glycoproteins that are in the brain. So if loperamide only had the opioid effect, and it does, it does get you high, and it also causes respiratory depression just like heroin. But because you need to take so much of it, another toxicity ensues with loperamide, and that is cardiotoxicity. The loperamide will bind to several electrolyte channels in the heart muscle, and that will make people very prone to arrhythmias. So these people come in intoxicated with opioids, not breathing, but also in cardiac dysrhythmias. And the problem with these dysrhythmias is that they're very difficult to treat. We treat these things with magnesium and sodium bicarbonate and intralipid and amiodarone and sometimes even pacing. And we simply can't get people out of dysrhythmias. They're very, very resistant to dysrhythmias. And there are multiple cases of people that are brought in unresponsive on cardiac arrest. And when they wake up, they have have a pacemaker implanted with a defibrillator. And the reason that happened is because nobody knew why they were down. Nobody knew they were abusing loperamide. And so we attributed them being unconscious, them having an arrhythmia. So at this point, given the state of where we're at, what is the game plan for trying to solve this problem of dealing with these addictions that people are not opting into in the normal way? That's a great question. And that's the question that city councils and state councils and national level have been trying to answer. From the medical perspective, medical education and policy has changed significantly in that physicians undergo training now in terms of what is safe prescribing practices. There's been lots of research in how to manage chronic pain, and it's realized that opioids are not a good solution for that. So the prescribing practices have really changed. The reality is that the supply has vastly increased. So as much as we can do on the medical side, uh, you can't really change the fact that it's out there on the streets and people can get access to it. The work that we particularly have done is looking at naloxone. And again, that's just a band-aid to the problem. It doesn't help people relieve their addiction or reduce the prevalence in a community. So no one really knows honestly what to do right now. The only programs we have which have been in place forever have been the Suboxone programs and Methadone programs. But in terms of stopping the growing trend, if you have a solution, please share. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Dr. Ike Blom and Maria Steiner for taking the time for those conversations. That one just seemed rife with amazing statistics and not not amazing in a good way, obviously. But the idea that the opiate epidemic is now killing more people than AIDS when AIDS was at its height of deadliness, that kind of had my jaw on the floor. I didn't realize it was as bad as all that. There's that old 1980s movie, They Live, where Rowdy Roddy Piper puts on the glasses and all of a sudden can see the people that are alien infiltrators. And while that's not the greatest movie in the world, it's a great reference point for how sometimes things can just be completely invisible to us if we don't know what to look for. To the best of my knowledge, I don't have anybody that's really close in my life that is affected by the opiate crisis directly. You know, knock on wood, I hope that continues to be true. But it's weird to think the extent to which our individual social bubbles can keep us from being aware of these ground-swelling things that might be going on sociologically. If there's one overarching takeaway to all that, I loved his point that a physician's goal should be to get somebody to the point where their pain is tolerable, but not where it's pain-free. Basically, pain should be pain 
painful. It's there for a reason. And if we put ourselves in sort of a constant comfort and pleasure bubble, then that has a lot of unforeseen, unintended consequences for the way that our brains operate. Should you or someone you know have a problem with drugs be looking for treatment, the National Institute of Health has its National Institute on Drug Abuse. They've got a treatment locator that can hook you up with a group in your area. The phone number within the U.S. is 1-800-662-HELP, or HELP is 4357 if you're more numerically inclined. Here's hoping that all of you out there are pain-free and also opiate addiction-free. And now let's move on to something less addictive and less dangerous, the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So we are all curious creatures. The default assumption is that we want to know what happens. We want to know what's going to happen. What keeps you watching a TV show during the commercials or turning to the next page in a book is curiosity about what is going to happen. But researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Germany were looking at the opposite. What it is that makes people want to maintain ignorance when they need not necessarily do so. They called their paper Cassandra's Regret, The Psychology of Not Wanting to Know. Referencing the character in Greek mythology, Cassandra, who could see things in the future and she could tell people what was going to happen, but nobody believed her. So an extremely frustrating set of superpowers and curses altogether. But the study's lead author, Gerd Geigerenzer, thought that not wanting to know what will happen in our own future is more common than we typically think. And it might be as much the norm as curiosity is in a lot of ways. So he decided to gather the data to dig into this. His team conducted two nationally representative studies in Germany and Spain of over 2,000 adults, questioned them about potential events positive and negative in their future at various time courses, something that could happen in the next five minutes or something that might not happen for 50 years, and would they want to know these details about their own lives? His work was published just recently by the American Psychological Association's Psychological Review Journal and got some really interesting findings. He found that 85 as much as 90% of people would not want to know about upcoming negative events in their own life, and that the nearer that these events were to happening, the less that they would want to know. So if you're going to be hit by a car in the next five minutes, you want to know that even less than if you're going to be hit by a car 20 years from now, which seems a bit counterintuitive, but the, with the way that these questions were posed, you couldn't necessarily use the foreknowledge to avoid something. So you couldn't dive out of the way of the car and miraculously save yourself. Equally interesting, 40 to 70% of people preferred to remain ignorant of upcoming positive events. And in fact, the four reasons that he identified for the desirability of deliberate ignorance were to avoid the negative emotions that the foreknowledge of negative events could cause, to maintain surprise and a sense of suspense. So not knowing what's going to happen to your favorite character until you get to the end of the book that kind of thing. To gain a strategic advantage, which I imagine means if you're a politician and you want to maintain plausible deniability, say, oh, I didn't know about that, and actually have it be true, and you're, you're maintaining your lack of knowledge because you suspect if you knew that you'd be in trouble. And finally, to better implement fairness and impartiality. So this is kind of wanting to maintain the benefit of the doubt, and you need doubt in order to do that. There were only 1% of participants in the study who consistently wanted to know everything across the board, tell me the future, I'm all ears. And the data between the demographic groups of the studies in Germany and Spain was pretty consistent. These patterns seemed to hold the only thing where more people wanted to know about the future than didn't want to know was finding out the sex of an unborn child, where 37% of people said that they would prefer not to know until the baby's born said Geigerenzer. Wanting to know appears to be the natural condition of humankind and in no need of justification. People are not just invited, but also often expected to participate in early detection of cancer screening or in regular health checkups to subject their unborn babies to dozens of prenatal genetic tests. Not wanting to know appears counterintuitive and may raise eyebrows, but deliberate ignorance, as we've shown here, doesn't just exist. It's a widespread state of mind. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, so that is all for episode number 180. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. If you're curious about the links to anything that we discussed here, that'll be up online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 180. And last week, if you missed episode number 179, I spoke with Dr. Sean Talbot about something called Tonka Dali. And next week, we're going to be talking about one of the major unsung ways in which people change their brains, or at least we don't typically think of it that way, but our educational system. We're going to be talking about the future of education with an educational philosopher who is very much brain-based in his approach, thinking about what education currently does look like in most of the world and what it really should look like based on what we now know about neuroscience. Very interesting topic, some controversy and head-scratching about potential futures coming up next week. So I will see you back here next Friday, same time, same podcast, and with that same unwavering commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. 
Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.